Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain, you're listening to episode 23 of the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us today, it's just hymns. Well, it's been a bit of a long fortnight here, more than two weeks, actually, uh, as we took time to celebrate Tofurky Night at my place, and I assume, what, McDonald's Night at your place in the middle of nowhere Arizona, well, right? Gee, thanks. Though, uh, yeah, it was it was literally McDonald's night because I'm stuck out in the middle of nowhere and have no family in this state. If I was home, I would have done something more than that. But you really, did you really like go out and get a giant thing of tofu and like carve it into the shape of a turkey? No, that's not what a tofurkey is. Well, I didn't get the tofurkey brand loaf, which is a it's it's a brand. I actually got the Trader Joe's loaf, which was 13 bucks. It was a good deal. It was like two pounds of food and it had gravy with it too. So it it was worth it. And it probably saved me money of making it myself, to be honest. So I spent a total of like $30 for like a week's worth of food. So that's always a win. You you can have gravy as a vegan? Yeah, I can have hella gravy. I mean, mushroom gravy. But but gravy is fat. Gravy, well, the fat can be from any source. So you... yeah, but what, but it's beef gravy or chicken gravy or country gravy, which is sausage and milk. Right. So in this particular case, the flavorings usually come from like mushrooms or from like nutritional yeast or something like that. Just whatever you have laying around for flavor. But anyway, I so see. so I was out making the gravy fountain. I had the big old like. Thing that comes up the bird comes in and starts like drinking all i'm kidding that's a meme um <laughs> if you guys have ever seen the meme with the bird with the chocolate fountain if you've not seen that go check it out just type in uh chocolate fountain bird you'll see it it's, it's funny it's an, it's oh nice i know thing. i've seen gifts of that I've oh yeah it's that. that bird looks like it's the happiest bird on the planet but anyway i mean aside from all of that the new cycle has been just as crazy and chaotic as usual adorned with the same spin it always has but there are many positives uh one of them being that voters across the nation actually went out and voted large numbers for progressive measures even if not all the races kind of win as we hope measure three in massachusetts as we mentioned that won by a huge margin over 60 percent uh which is landslide territory in terms of votes that measure gave transgender people protections against discrimination in public spaces, including businesses. So a big win there, just a lot of big wins electorally, even if, like I said, the elections didn't necessarily go as as good as we would hope. As I all through the midterms was saying, like ballot initiatives are the only one of really the only way in our current setup of so-called democracy that you can actually influence the society and that should be taken at every cost so it's good i mean i didn't doubt that it was going to pass but i'm that it passed by a landslide is a the best possible news and b gives you every indication that the people really like as you're walking on the street if you're afraid oh they're all secret fascists they're not like their numbers are small and most of the people if they could actually do something would actually do something empowered to do something would have wiped away all of this a long time ago that was my take also another important thing that's happened measure 105 in oregon also failed which was actually a good thing that it failed because that was the uh, conservatives trying to play their uh remove the sanctuary status from the state game and that fell by a big margin so that was another net positive also one of the actually the biggest positives though of the election was actually the governorships and many of the state houses also kind of flipped blue too uh which is important because of the whole coke conspiracy if you're familiar with that or what i like to call the coke coup where since really the 1970s there's been this ploy by the Koch brothers to essentially get people elected into governorships and have the Republican Party take over the state houses so that they could force a constitutional convention. And this election actually was a big loss for them on that front because they lost, I believe it was six governorships 
and they were just a few governorships away from actually getting it. So they actually lost a lot of ground when it comes to that. Which makes me wonder why they didn't go harder on that front. And maybe they're more disorganized than they really want to show to the world. Because, I mean, if they wanted that, if they really wanted to push for that, they could have probably had that. You know, I know my state, like really early on in this administration, passed a motion to call a convention. I'm really surprised that that wasn't like their full blown, full steam ahead strategy. Speaking of, you know, governorship and state elections, your your state, didn't you have a, a what was it, tiered, tiered voting? on your uh, as one of your ballot initiatives yes i believe that that did pass for the uh, county that was for the county it wasn't for the state oh oh damn i wonder why i wasn't hearing more about that because i uh, you told me about it. i thought i thought it was for the whole state this is only for the county though does that mean that like every single person with any ideology ever is going to come out of the woodwork uh perhaps like uh it it really depends. I think it's going to give a lot more power uh, to leftists at the local level now. It does pave the way for it to happen at the state level because I don't think that we were the only place that had this particular thing on its on its ballot initiative items, even within Oregon. And it is kind of a big movement that is gaining steam. It's called star voting. And if you're not familiar with it, I, I really do actually recommend it. But there was a lot of negative stuff, though, that did happen with the election as well. As we know, Florida and Georgia were just basically one huge clusterfuck when it comes to the elections that both Florida and Georgia, the governorships were essentially won through electoral fraud and voter dis disenfranchisement. Stacey Abrams, I am convinced, uh, was essentially just robbed of the governorship because all of the ballots weren't even counted. Even when they did the, the recount, they were still playing dirty with it. And of course, Gillum in Florida, kind of the same thing happened where they had a recount and the Republican Party went nuts over that. They were claiming all sorts of conspiracy theories in, in, in Florida that was going on at the time, including the same old strategy that Democrats were voting multiple times, making baseless claims like, oh, the Democrats are just going out to their cars and putting on different shirts and coming back in and voting again, kind of. Walking in with the freaking Groucho mask with the mustache, the pink nose. That's what I was thinking. Is that they just what they just come in with the <laughs> Groucho Marx masks? Just I am I'm I'm one of the Marx brothers. Jeez, my favorite Marx brother is Carl. <laughs> so in Alabama, this is specifically heartbreaking, though. I mean, Stacey Adams wasn't Georgia. Really... Yeah, Stacey Abrams. Yeah, Georgia. I'm sorry. What did I say? Alabama. Yeah, Georgia. Yeah, George, I mean, she wasn't the most progressive person. She wasn't campaigning on single payer. If she did, she probably would have blown everything out of the water. Why won't they do that? Why won't they do that? Why? Well, I mean, I know why, because like they'll take money from pharmaceutical companies and there's only so far that they'll let them push the envelope. She had sort of made it her whole life's mission to come to that moment in terms of voting voter suppression and black voter suppression in that state and it's really sad because that was her whole life like that was her moment that was what she had built her entire career upon was getting to that moment and defeating the republican vote suppression machine that has existed in the south since forever well, and they, they that's did. a tall order to defeat and she didn't she didn't do it and that's I feel really sorry for her even if she like is not even a progressive and is just basic liberal I still feel sorry for her well that and to top that all off just to kind of give you how much of a spectacle the Georgia elections were after the elections in Georgia uh, there was a protest down at the Georgia State House and they actually arrested a black congresswoman who went down and spoke with some of the protesters for essentially doing her job and speaking to her constituents the capitol police had the audacity to arrest her yeah and i mean it's not like they didn't know who she was and it's not like she was i mean she wasn't even doing what ocasio cortez did like she wasn't even joining in a sit-in she wasn't disrupting she was just talking to them 
yeah, so I mean, let's talk about Ocasio. But first, uh, one thing that I, I did want to mention, though, uh, on the, the front of voter suppression, there was one positive in Florida that did come out of the election, and that was that they did vote down the felony rule in Florida. So the rule is, is if you're charged with a felony, you can't vote for life. Uh, what they did is they actually struck down that rule. And so pretty much if you went to jail and were released, once you're released, you can vote, which wow. is, is a vast improvement because obviously this put uh, minority communities, which really just means uh, in this particular case, Democratic voters at a disadvantage. And this essentially added one million people to the role. So that really tells you how many people have been incarcerated in Florida for one million people to have their vote restored? So, Was it retroactive as well? Well, it's, it's like well, it ha well, it is retroactive. It's it counts for everybody that's committed a felony thus in the past. If that's what you're asking, yes, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Given the numbers and the sway and the demographics, I think that Florida just became a blue state. But that also doesn't mean that Democrats should rest on their laurels. And oh, also, no. it really and just... Next time! <laughs> yeah. I mean, as far, though, as like Ocasio, I have to say, I'm very impressed. I actually did not expect I am that. I blown away. I, I did not expect that to be the first thing that she was going to do after uh, getting elected. That was a declaration of war against the party, against Pelosi. And she knew that and she did it, which means that she's she's more in touch and she knows more. She, she's not your basic like social Democrat. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't think she's a communist. I mean, we can't expect a revolution from her, but she definitely knows the power that comes with having the working class on her side. I mean, if she can walk into a bakery, I think it was a bakery, she walked into something celebrating with friends that she had won, and literally the entire staff demanded she come to the kitchen and they presented her with a cake that they baked for her. Like, that's how powerful this woman is. And she knows that that power could be more powerful than Pelosi and all of her money. I mean, we can't expect the revolution from her, but man, I'm cheering her on just because it's so refreshing to see someone fight for once. It definitely. It does give me a lot of hope for like the progressives. Although I, I was upset, but I expected that Nancy Pelosi was going to come back as Speaker of the House. Of course, why would they not pick Nancy Pelosi, the worst possible choice for just... It's it's neither here nor there. I mean, the the progressive pushback against it was great. Ocasio going in there and protesting against Pelosi, showing that like the liberals are not going to be excused from uh, the the actual resistance this time. And the sign said, "Step up or step out of the way." It was literally saying, "Do something or leave, and we will kick you out." Yeah, it do wasn't your job. Save the earth. Yeah. It was get the fuck out. The other th thing that also I wasn't surprised about with uh, Ocasio was like the liberal response to this. And of course, like the conservatives jumping in on it. And it was so hard to tell the two apart, to be honest with they you. They took the bait. Yeah, well, I love that they took the bait. They did. And like the, the whole news cycle for like the conservatives and even like a lot of the liberals were just like jumping on her in the most like classist and sexist manner possible i mean fox news had the gall to just show like how much they really dislike the working class by mocking her for not being able to afford a place in dc and then making the claim well oh you could afford this clothes for the photo shoot even though she borrowed those clothes and you know the best part is is that she laid that intentionally her tweet that set that all off about not being able to afford a place in dc and her clothes which she wrote specifically to be in this kind of like ditzy manner to get them to jump on it i'm amazed they took that bait like i've never seen a republican take bait before it's always worked the other way around it was amazing I don't know. Like I've seen enough of them on on the internet do it, and they they take bait all the time. Like they freak out over just the 
the most banal things they will just freak out about. I was actually surprised that they took that particular piece of bait. I mean, it just seemed a little bit too obvious, but now, now I gotta wonder, you know, like, like what else can we do? I mean, cause like I, I bait conservatives all the time and I find it funny. Okay, I've never seen them take the bait on a national level in a way in which it was broadcast on the news for a news cycle that made them look bad and they couldn't just refrain from doing it. Well, I mean, I guess that's true. That <laughs> I will have to say, I just congratulations to Ocasio on that one. But I do think the big takeaway here, though, is one, we can't and we should not be relying just on elections to change things uh, simply because that's just not not going to work right. now like the, like the elections are over we've had our celebrations everybody had a good laugh because like ocasio set up the bait and also declared war against the uh, the liberal establishment within the republic or within the liberal establishment within the republican party god i messed that one up didn't i within the democratic <laughs> party with both sides both sides, yes. So the liberal establishment within the Democratic Party, what I was going to say here is that we can't just rely on election. Right. Change is not going to come out of that. We now need to get organized now that the election's over. Like what I was going to say in the beginning in reference to the ranked choice passing in your county, you know, if a bunch of leftists suddenly flood seats in that county, what, what are what are they gonna do? Are they going to use their position to fly by night and organize unions? Because that's about the only way that a leftist is going to be able to use their position in the state to do anything really leftist. And that's what I'm hoping is on the mind of these progressives. They realize that they're not just gonna go there to watch a bunch of legislation die in committee. And Ocasio is sending the message that she at least seems to understand this, that they're going to spend most of their time not doing that, doing anything anywhere else involving working people. So one of the reasons that we can't just rely on legislation and change through legislation is because of how the legislative process works. And one of the prime examples of this, actually, just to kind of give you how kind of cursed and evil the Republican Party is. The Republican Party wanted to get this bill passed. It was called the Manage Our Wolves Act. It, it is a horrible bill. Essentially, this bill would remove gray wolves from the endangered species list, which would allow the hunting of wolves of course, they, they realize that the Democrats aren't going to go with this and probably a lot of some of the Republicans might not even even go for it because it's rather it's a heinous thing. And people in America, they kind of like wolves, um, except for farmers and cattle ranchers and stuff like that. Well, so I don't like wolves. Every wolf I've met has been a jerk. All the wolves in this fandom are horrible. You get just get rid of the wolves. I could tell I'm that kidding. that was sarcasm. Like yes, they're, they're big and fluffy. Wolves so, are cute. They're not my favorite Bara daddy, but they're cute. Do we have to describe to our listeners what Bara is for those that don't know? Because that's just like big dudes that are like chubby, but also muscular. So like, think Alex Jones. You're actually going to put this part in the yes. show. Um, <laughs> I might put it in the show here just to embarrass you. Essentially, what has happened here is that the Republican Party wanted to pass this bill and so what they did was there was a democratic measure going through at the same time to end the intervention in yemen and so the republican party decided to insert this measure into the the manage our wolves bill so that they could get everybody to act on this particular bill and then that way the Republicans get what they want, the Democrats get what they want, but it sucks because now we have to choose between save the wolves or save the children. Who do you choose, Batman? The wolves or the Yemeni children? I mean, yeah, this is this is Joker super, level stuff. This is comic book style villainy in legislative form. God, as boring as you could make it. The worst comic book ever. 
It's the hell world that we live in. This is what it, it's boiled down to. But so essentially the reason that the Republican Party did this, though, the way that they did it is because if they left the bill as it is, the, the Yemeni Civil War bill, and allowed that to go through, the Democrats could pass it through the uh, Rules Committee and make it go directly to the floor for vote under the War Powers Act of 1973. By inserting it into another bill, the bill no longer is, is applicable for the War Powers Act. The bill can't go directly to the floor to vote. What even is the point of congressional rules when they literally just can get through them or ignore them or change them or rewrite them whenever the hell they want? <laughs> what even is the point? Why do people fall for it? Yay, we passed a new rule and it's going to stop this thing. The future is saved and humanity is restored. And then literally every single next congressional session, oh, that rule, by the way, it's, it's gone. Ignoring it. Which, which, like I said, I mean, that's the the importance of organizing because that's this is the kind of thing that happens when we just rely on legislative power to change things is one if there's something one party doesn't like they'll put it to another bill and poison the bill and then it's either going to be a bill that nobody wants to vote on or somebody's going to have to make a very severe compromise on and both parties do this so they're, they're you know both sides are guilty of it uh, if you will just th this kind of honestly legislative legislative villainy as as i described it is very common in Congress and why, and it, it really is the prime example of why we need to be organized so that we, the working class, can push things. Well, also, you know why we need to be organized is because imagine if we were more organized than we are, and we're getting more organized day by day. I'm starting to see like Socialist Rifle Association stuff pop up. Well, I'm not even looking for it. It's happening. Imagine if we were organized and I was sitting in Congress somehow and was more radical than, you know, the social Democrats or whatever that are there. And this bill came on my desk. I would have signed it to stop the war in Yemen, even at the cost of the wolves, because I would know there would be an organized left that would immediately be out there in the forest protecting the wolves and shooting at police and shit like there was for the pipeline. I would know that I could roll that dice being fairly confident in my side to be able to not let that horrible Batman villain scheme come to pass. Right. And there are a lot of great organizations out there that actually do this, j just that. They, they go out there and they do protect animals. And if that's something that you want to do, then... I'm honestly all for it. I think environmental activism is is very important. Just like any other form of direct action, it's it's a very valid and legitimate thing that we need. One thing I've come to the conclusion on, though, about direct action, that kind of going and taking over the forest, is that I think where a lot of activists failed in the 90s, when there was the first attempt to really go and do that, was they didn't lay groundwork and make connections in the working class first. They just sort of went in there into the forest, severed power lines, took it over, and that made it really easy for the state to go, these eco-terrorists want to take away your comfort. Vote Democrat or Republican and we'll save you. And really the most important thing like when it comes down to it, like just I'm going to be leftist Bill Clinton here. It's the workers, stupid. It's whatever you do, no matter what you do, you've got to have connections with the working class because they've got to know why you're going out and doing that. Otherwise, they won't support you and they'll fall for state propaganda that says you're evil and trying to take stuff away from them. Right. And that's one of the big problems that I've noticed uh, that a lot of environmental organizations have is that they do come off anti-worker, even though there is a large intersection between environmentalism and workers' rights and workers need to be for environmental policy. So one of the, the big problems here is that the, the messaging that the environmentalists have is often really poor and doesn't show those those intersections there and doesn't convey why to the working class that their work is important and it comes off as the environmentalists trying to take something away or destroy something 
and not the actual reason that this thing that they're doing is important and not like how this actually helps the working class. And then a lot of the times the like actual solutions are, are not really communicated either. But the fact is environmental policy is very important for the working class because everybody shares the environment. Everybody lives in it regardless if they want to or not. You don't have a choice. If your environment becomes degraded, then it does affect things like your health. It can affect your opportunities to work. It may even determine whether or not you do work. I mean, in terms of things like global warming with climate change, affecting how crops grow and all that stuff that's going to have a big effect on the lives of millions of farmers not just in the united states but around the world and certain crops just may not be viable which would devastate workers in in many areas and it's that long-term thing that long-term vision that needs to be communicated to them because in a way, work is diametrically opposed to environmentalism. Because what are most people employed in in some roundabout way? When it comes down to it, they're employed in destroying the environment. They're employed in drilling for oil or they're employed in a warehouse that moves a bunch of plastic products that were derived from drilling for oil or they drive those products from warehouse to warehouse. Environmental activism has a very direct impact on work and the first reactionary thing an uninformed worker is going to do is, well, they're going to take my job. And if they do this, then I won't be able to drive the truck full of plastic products from point A to point B and be able to afford my pitiful little box of an apartment. It's, you know, the, the long term goal needs to be communicated. And for that to be communicated effectively, there needs to be an offer of support us and you'll never have to do that stupid driving job again. Or if you enjoy it, it's going to be made something that you actually enjoy because you'll have power in it and you won't be driving useless fidget spinners from point A to point B. And speaking of uh, the environment here, every now and then uh, we get a person that approaches me that uh, wants me to do an ad read. And uh, this was one I just I, I couldn't resist doing here. So the liberals they just wrote in and they were like, yeah, we want an ad for liberalism. I was like, OK, I'll, I'll do that. So so here we go. Are you a liberal? Do you love the environment? Are you tired of all the poor people overbreeding? Well, try Malthusiasm. With Malthusiasm, you too can smugly drive around in your new Ford Prius while you blame the poor and working class the world over for environmental problems caused by your own consumption. Malthusiasm. Call in the next 15 minutes to get a free dog whistle. 1-800-M-A-L-T-H-U-S. I'm legit impressed you actually like put that phone number together. That was good. When I did that skit, I was like, yes, it's 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 the appropriate amount of numbers long. <laughs> Don't ask me what the actual number translates to it. It probably is a porn line if you call it. But if somebody wants to call that number and figure out where that goes, let me know how that worked out for you. But yeah, there you it's go. Fun. And man, have, have the Malthusiasts been coming out lately? I'll, I'll tell you what. And, and for people who don't know, Malthus was another 18th century philosopher, a contemporary of Marx, whose entire thing comes down to, well, it's survival of the fittest because humans overpopulate. There's going to be too many poor people and we need all the resources for the very much rich, rich very much white bourgeois class. Without him directly saying so, the obvious conclusion from that is genocide the poor people. And it's really scary because when I'm on Reddit and I'm on like environmentalist subreddits, places where there aren't people from the Donald, it's not fascists who are like coming and doing this. It's liberals whose first conclusion is we need population control. And that's terrifying because these are liberals who are without even realizing it one step away from advocating genocide that really scared me when i saw that because it's just can, can you not think through what you're saying and i immediately started posting you know no it's not that it's the mode of production and socialism and yada yada and all the stuff you'd expect as a retort to that but it still kept coming it's really concerning for me 
So get on that, everyone. Go to Reddit and start telling the Malthusian liberals to shut the hell up. Well, maybe not shut the hell up, but like educate them. Put it out there what the actual facts are. We produce enough food, feed 12 billion people. We throw most of it away. The problem isn't feeding and housing people, giving them care. The problem is, is in the distribution of resources. Which, of course, is always going to be a commodity that's going to enrich the wealthy. And it's, you have to really compartmentalize your thinking and like not be able to see the way things connect into a system to be able to not see articles of we throw away a bunch of food and instead of going, wow, we need to change our mode of production, go to, wow, we need less poor people or, well, yeah, we do need less poor people, but wow, you know, we need to start killing off the poor people or what, you know, a, a lot of people do is, well, we need to bring back this obscure law that fixes it. I really don't understand how people can't see systems, can only see parts of it. And I think that's what comes down to it for a lot of people who come to that quasi-Malthusian conclusion. They can't see the entire system. They can only see one part of it. It's, it's being trapped in an ideology is really what it is. And like I said, getting out there, getting organized, spreading information. It's its that whole, like the three-step process that we, we always like to say, educate, agitate, organize. It's a process. And right now... As, as far as liberals go, we're, we're still in that education process for, for many. It, it doesn't hit everybody at the same time. And you can't expect it to because everybody's conditions and what they're exposed to is different. And also, some people have been living in denial of things and are still living in denial of things just because things are bad. Sometimes sticking your head in the ground sounds like a good idea, even if it doesn't help. There's a train. Hold on. You mean like five dudes on top of you? At Ram Ranch, <laughs> gonna <laughs> fuck some cowboy butts on a train. The train's really chugging tracks to Ram Ranch. I knew you were gonna go there. That was with too the good. That they could actually be one of them. I can't believe I was oh, able man. to do that. You're gonna be the next Ram Ranch guy. I'm gonna make the Ram Ranch video. <laughs> Oh, God. You know there's over 60 of those now, right? Jesus Christ. You can get a box set of them, too, on CD. 28 cowboys on a big caboose, Johnny. All that train on his caboose. Stop. Okay. Is the train gone? <laughs> yes, the train's gone. <laughs> Before we got derailed okay i will stop. don't start the next item that i did want to get to today is a story coming out of china the communist party in china and the chinese government have taken to cracking down on marxists and maoists in china and they're mostly targeting labor protesters strikers and student activists at uh, universities and this has been going on for quite a while in china if you've been paying attention to the news wildcat strikes in china have been on the increase for the last almost six or seven years now it seems like it's been ramping up but now they're really going after the student protesters and the labor strikers this is all kind of in opposition to everything that Xi Jinping has said about how like Marxism is going to be the, the future in China and everything. Because you've got this leader here that's saying one thing about China and then his policies and the Chinese Communist Party are doing another thing. Xi Jinping is joining another long line of world leaders that say one thing about their country and society and then do another. Except in China, in a way, it, it's a big, well, what the hell did you expect? Like Xi Jinping has upped the classes involving Marxism and told the professors to make it much more interesting and engaging and to teach the revolution more. And That was exactly my thought on the matter was is that 
He's saying all this. He's encouraging all of this. He's out there like saying this and encouraging the communist ideology and pushing how important Marx is. And then people are looking around because they're studying what Marx actually said. And they're realizing, hey, this Chinese comedy thing isn't really doing the thing that it's supposed to do. And then they go out there and they do the thing that, you know, Marx talked about and the Chinese Communist Party cracks down on them and says, no, well, you, you can't do that. You, you can curb your enthusiasm a little bit. The fact is, is that you know, the reason these people are doing this is because the conditions in China right now are just awful for a lot of the workers. It's their version of the 60s because their living standards have never been higher. There is at the same time a huge disparity of wealth and a racism problem in terms of non-Han Chinese. That's a great way of putting that. And that's something that I really didn't think of when putting this all together, that it does kind of resemble the 60s in many ways. As far as like China goes, it's really hard to get any information that's correct out about China because it either comes from shady, questionable NGOs that are trying to sell this story so that the military industrial complex can get involved and of course do their thing and sell essentially a war. And then you have the Chinese state media, Xinhua, on the other side, which is honestly one of the worst propaganda outlets out there in terms of like people want to talk about russia today being ridiculous just go watch xinhua it's up there with press tv in terms of how ridiculous it can be sometimes at the same time as their society is more prosperous and more people are out of poverty than ever before it's leaving a large portion of the country behind at the same time they have this sort of savior figure in Xi Jinping, who is trying to bring the second coming of Mao, if you will, in a lot of the way that Kennedy and Johnson were supposed to be as progressive as Roosevelt was, which is just falling on its face because the party is so captured by the Chinese bourgeoisie. And so you have this group of people in society that their life is getting more prosperous in terms of things, but they're but also- But it's not spreading to all of China and also the conditions aren't necessarily improving at a rate that's anywhere remotely near acceptable. I mean, because even though like some of these people do live middle-class lives from a monetary standpoint per se, some of these jobs might also require them to work 16 hours a day in a factory that has suicide nets. So you know it's a great place to work when they have those installed. Right. So you end up in the situation where you have a society in which the individual members are wealthy enough to do something about it. If you look at American society, the two times in which we've been the most revolutionary have been when we had the most income inequality, and also, ironically, we had the least income inequality. We had the least income inequality in the 60s. I, I mean, yes, there were black people in the South who lived in shacks without electricity and white people who lived in giant New York towers, but Overall, like the corporate tax rate was high and there were a lot of public services and education in California was very much free and education was very accessible to most people and things were distributed much better now then than, than they are now. So you ended up with a population, a young population of students that had the capacity and capability to do something about it. And that's the, the point in which China is in right now, I think in that they have enough of a population, has enough disposable money and weight to throw around to say, hey, wait a minute, these two things aren't matching up. And I think that, that scares Xi Jinping. Ev everyone knows that that debt crash is coming in terms of American student debt, in terms of international debt. And what what is Xi Jinping himself gonna do when he's said all this stuff about Marxism but didn't deliver on it. The other part of that is the capitalist element of the Chinese economy constantly requires economic growth. And so that's essentially been their policy is just to do whatever it takes to pursue economic growth 
even to the point of building all these empty cities out in the desert eventually that's got to stop because that's not going to work because that's not really benefiting the chinese people like you said a lot of these people see that they see what Marx wrote because Xi Jinping is saying, oh, go read Marx. And <laughs> it turns out, you know, it's, it's it's not there. But the whole disturbing part about this is the the government cracking down on essentially people going out and doing exactly what in many ways Xi Jinping said to go out and do and in roundabout ways. It does kind of give me hope because, I mean, in some way, I guess I'm hoping that either Xi Jinping capitulates and changes direction or maybe this is the beginning of a new chapter or something bigger you know revolution 3.0 since well they technically already had two revolutions in china well you also have to consider the risk of going after that socialist state which is what a lot of tankies shore up as saying oh these marxists are horrible they're going after the socialist state we have to stop them because yeah you are attacking the social state and that's going to make inroads for chinese fascists which i guarantee they're there they exist which is going to make inroads for the united states to get in and start funding and supporting those chinese fascists that's going to mean capitalist regime change and they can just get in there that's the other part of this is that while this is all happening of course we have all these ngos in china that like i said are spreading all this misinformation out there about China as well and muddying the waters on things like I said it doesn't help that of course Xinhua is, is not exactly transparent about China either it becomes really hard to tell what's truth and what isn't just kind of like there is a lot of hype going on about what's going on in the uh, the Uyghur territory that whole scenario where NGOs were called actually essentially taking stories and spinning them and lying about the actual happenings behind the concentration of, of Uyghurs, which is a serious issue, but it turns out that maybe it's not what it looks like entirely, that they're bloating up the numbers, that they're making up stories to make it way worse than it is. And when it comes to those kind of situations, there's no need to lie about it to blow it up. It's, it's bad enough as it is. Another thing that I see that the NGOs are, are publishing recently is they're really going hard on the social credit system, which actually I found a very non-sensationalist article that actually like broke down and explained what it is. And yeah, it's creepy and bad, but it's not more creepier and bad than really anything else. Uh, once you actually look at the scope of what it actually covers versus what's being said about it are two different things and so if i actually if i find that article i, I will actually link it down in the uh the show notes and everything so that everybody can go read it ngos are also starting to target rojava too they re, uh, what well, amnesty international recently put out this report that slanders and blames points fault at the ypg and the kurds for quote destroying half of raqqa how that's a crime against humanity and you know prep prepping for what we all know is coming the day that the u.s turns on them and decides to start bombing them and someone that i i know on twitter who is who fought you know was a volunteer was an internationalist brigade volunteer in rojava spent like two hours thrashing apart their argument you know, talking about how, yeah, there was a lot of destruction. We were taking the city from the Islamic State. The Islamic State set up a lot of traps and destroyed a lot of the city themselves in their retreat because they wanted a fearic victory. Like, it was all worth it because they, you know, when they freed Yazidi slave women, that's why they blew up the city, to free women who were slaves. And they didn't blow up the city, by the way. It was the United States jets bombing the city that did it you know working in conjunction with the yp with the with the ypj and the ypg and i think they just hope that people either only half pay attention to things or don't remember things you know not even two years ago isis was this big horrible evil boogeyman in the western press and now they're starting to tear apart the people who tore apart those people because they're starting to be successful yeah, and they're and starting to show hope and promise to the going world. back to how this 
all connects in with China and everything is, yeah, we do need to be skeptical about or NGO sourced information when it comes to China because they are trying to facilitate a conflict with China. That's not going to be good for the Chinese people. They're doing this in specific to destroy Marxism in China in, in any form. And not that I, I would consider what the, the, the Communist Party to be true Communist Party in China. I, th I think it's a little bit of a letdown. In terms of the NGOs actually caring about these Marxist protesters, I don't really think that it's really about that as so much because the truth is, is like you said, they would just rather find some corporate fascists or some, some liberals to prop up. That'll just be the new government if they have their way. The important thing to take away from it is that even in China, you know, we have allies. We need to start talking with them and we need to really make this international. So yeah, everyone I, needs a Weibo account. Uh, uh, we need to have a what account? We need to have a Weibo account. A, the, the, a Weibo. Like, Chinese Twitter. Oh, it's, not, it's not weeaboo it's it's not weeaboo. i thought it i thought that was an intentional joke no no part. no it's it's not it's not like i accidentally called it a weeaboo account once and like you've been saying that ever since it's weibo or or something like that it's weibo yeah well, whatever it is it's chinese twitter and you need to start going and making a bunch of accounts on it because they're going to shut you down and you're going to need to use it through vpns because they're going to shut down the vpns you start finding these Marxists because the paint is starting to peel off the walls there in China. And, and them knowing that there are actual leftists in the Western world. Yeah, that we're not all dead. Yeah, that, that's, that's a huge mo morality boost for them because then they, they realize that, hey, you know, we're not alone. That like, hey, there, there are people in America that feel this way too. There are people in Europe or there are people, you know, around the world. And, you know, the Marxism isn't this thing that the state dictates down and and everything. But, but they kind of already know that because they studied it. They <laughs> probably studied it more than I have. I mean, it's in their basic schooling. Which, I mean, you know, it should just go to say that if this is the direction that the Chinese so-called Communist Party wanted to go, then they should have just ditched the red flags and the hammers and sickles, abandoned the party name and just make it some liberal thing, right? Just bring out the old Kuomintang. Well, they can't do that because the Kuomintang flag is actually the flag of Taiwan. But, you know, bring out some old Republican Chinese flag and stick that on there and just let it go because... They've set, them, they've set themselves up here. Their flag, what, could, what their new flag could just be like a portrait of Dang. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just freaking take down Mao's picture, put up Dang's picture. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. You're making me sad now. So uh, we're, we're going to move on here. The, the right and terrorism and there's more of it. Yay. Why would there not be? Astounding astounded that there was not a mass shooting on black friday like i woke up black friday and was like oh god there's gonna be some mass shooting there's gonna be some horrible thing and i'm amazed it didn't happen the only person who died on black friday was that stupid missionary who went to the island that they all told him if you go here they'll kill you and he went anyway and they killed him wait i didn't hear about that what was that about this american like 20 something Christian missionary decided to go to this island that has a reputation for shooting arrows at any like missionary Western looking person that comes near it. That's under the protection of the Indian government. Oh, and just left that's alone. what that meme is about now. Oh, okay. I get, yeah, that's I, what that I meme saw, is about. I saw a meme about that and I was like, why are you guys posting this? Okay. Yeah, so the missionary went there and, and they killed him. He's being martyred all over the news and Christians are saying how oppressed they are. And everyone else is just like, why did you go, you dunce? Like, they told you if you go, you're gonna die. So he was oppressed because he was trying to oppress his beliefs on other people and they shot him <laughs> yes yes he invaded very, their house very very interesting worldview that they have there i will say getting back to to the main topic the stochastic terrorism uh and and the right so first trump right after the 
bombings occur uh, and, and all that. A few days after the election pass and Trump gets up on his podium and he makes this like bizarre statement about how Antifa would have like a really hard time if the right mobilized against him. And then he was talking about how we need to be more tougher and violent towards the left or something. During the speech though, like he says police and military, and then he says and other tough people. Okay, so he's alluding towards paramilitary groups like the Proud Boys and- Right, so he says this and this breaks down to me, breaks down for me in like three ways. A, when I heard about this and immediately did the rounds around the leftist social medias and Reddits and Twitters, like the universal consensus was, yeah, bring it on. You, you will take you down, fucker. Which is really ballsy, considering we have like a thousand people in the SRA. The Nazis are always going to outfund us. They're always going to out tank us. They're always going to out number us because they're middle class and upper class people who have free time and money and that and we work 10 to 12 hours a day for nothing for a box to live in if we're lucky that's not where our strength lies you know all the people say oh we can't fight the u.s military they have all the guns like that's not our strength it's never been our strength and we've won plenty of times throughout the past century in just these circumstances where we have been so massively outgunned and outtrained and outfunded and this and that. It tells me, A, the left is perfectly willing to take on that fight if and when it comes. The second thing is that the fascists are already mobilized against us. Like they already have been and they've been reduced to like five people a protest. And they get swarmed by like, you know, 700 to 1,000 antifas and black blocs. They're already mobilized, so what kind of threat is that? It, that revealed to me more about him than it did about what the fascists are going to do to us. It shows me that he considers us, us being the left, which probably to him just boils down to Antifa or whatever. He considers us the real opposition. He knows the the, the, the corporate liberal Democrats aren't going to be any opposition. They've confirmed every judge, every pick, every law, everything he's done, they've just gone with. So, like, they're not in the opposition. He knows they're not in the opposition. He knows that us, and for a good part, the social Democrats that are coming in, like Ocasio-Cortez and that Richard Ojeda guy, who... Well, well, see, you, you don't understand. When they go low, we go high. And capitulate. I mean, Hillary Clinton put out an article saying that we need to curb immigration to stop the Nazis. We need to become the Nazis to stop the Nazis. And then the Nazis will vote for us and we'll be in power. Yeah, but you'll also be Nazis. <laughs> They're not the opposition. He considers us the opposition. And that's everything that we need to know to make our moves on. That means it's time to start acting like the opposition. And from what I'm seeing, we are. So what you're actually saying is that Trump does actually make a discernment between Antifa and the left and the Democrats and the liberals. So you actually do believe that there is a discernment that is being made there. Because if one were to just look at the talking points, the talking point on the right typically is something along the lines of, Antifa is just the militant wing of the Democratic Party and they're all really just liberals and it's it doesn't matter if it's communism or liberalism they're all the same thing they're all Democrats right it's all it's all wraps up into a big bad for him for for, for them in so, their talking points so their talking points have never been what they really think and what they really know Trump even if it just comes down to his basic dumb animal instinct knows that there's a difference between because these social democrats and these leftists fight him and the democrat liberals corporatist liberals just roll the hell over and let him walk all over them even on just a basic animal animal instinct of you know who who kisses my ass and who slaps me in the face he knows there's a difference because he knows who is actually going to fight him who has been fighting him and his very strong people whatever that means uh, for two years, and the only people who have made progress. The thing with uh, Kavanaugh, the woman who brought the to attention his actions, wasn't connected with the Democratic Party. That wasn't something that Nancy Pelosi set up. That was a woman standing up for herself. So yeah, he considers the opposition 
the people who are standing up for themselves and the people who are standing up for themselves are the left. And it's it's not the corporatist liberals. The whole thing is, is like this is a pattern with Trump. Uh, he's called for violence against journalists. He's called for violence against protesters at his rallies where he said stuff like, I'll pay that guy's uh, legal fees. He recently, he applauded a uh, a lawmaker that body slammed a uh, journalist in Montana. I don't know if you remember that or not. That happened yeah, about, that. like a month ago. So yeah, the people who stand up to him and he knows the corporate Democrats don't. We're the opposition. Let's start acting like we're the opposition. The road is clear and the actions that we need to take are self-evident. Organize workplaces, spread information to workers, organize leftist gun SRA associations, join unions. Like it's we we know we know what to do and we're doing it. And yeah, we could be faster, but the more news comes out, honestly, the more hopeful I am because we seem to be on very good footing right now. Yeah, I, I think I think the path getting there is is really slow, and I kind of wish that by this time we we would at least have an infrastructure that's a little bit better for defending our communities and taking on the the paramilitary right wing organizations, and also just like honestly, at this point I was I was kind of hoping to maybe like start to see the beginnings of communes being set up. Things are progressing, you know, slowly and like them calling out us like this on this constant basis because it's not even just Trump, right? Tucker Carlson hit, uh, went out there and lied on his show about a uh, protest and then said that it was Antifa targeting him. And it, one, it really wasn't Antifa. It was just a general protest targeting him. Two, he also lied because he said that they tried to kick in his door and that they left like a giant dent in his door, which didn't happen. The only thing that did happen is somebody spray painted an anarchist symbol in his driveway. But, <laughs> but the person that did it got called out by the other people that were around him and they they oh, of course yeah. the liberals didn't fucking back him up well, as even, usual. even the other even, well damn. even the other anarchists like didn't didn't feel comfortable with that they thought that that was just one step a little bit too far because it was just something that could get the police involved even more than they would be see the only mistake they made is they should have put a hammer and sickle that would have really fucking scared people Nobody knows what the A is unless they're already on the left. I think it's a rock and roll thing. Punk music won't die. <laughs> I mean, it's it's Tucker Carlson. It's Steve King, who is not the writer, the legislator from Illinois, who unfortunately won his reelection. He, too endorses white nationalist candidates he's had numerous interviews with right-wing press organizations promoting like white genocide promoting the idea of the great replacement comparing immigrants to dirt which he actually denied and then there's like a tape of him actually saying it this whole the rhetoric that's been building up uh, among the higher echelons of the right wing and then these people then going out and saying wink wink nod nod we need to do something about these gd liberals or, or those commies or whatever and they're all the same that just preps these groups like the proud boys and like adam waffen to go out there attack these people it's even gotten so far like some of the propaganda out there is really scary. Chris Cantwell, the crying Nazi from um, the Charlottesville protests. So he put out a freaking video game where you essentially engage in numerous mass shootings to save Donald Trump. It's really gross. And like one of the scenes takes place in a gay bar called the LGBTQ plus agenda HQ. And in God, the scene, that's like a bad joke we would make yes, about ourselves. Exactly. It just it puts all the stereotypes that they like to spin about the LGBTQ community, uh, including like references like pedophilia and stuff like that. But this game was promoted on Gab. 
surprisingly enough. Oh, of and the reason it was promoted on Gab, of course, is because the trailer got pulled from YouTube because it was too much for even YouTube. Oh, hi, Eno. Oh, hey, Eno's here. So we're actually doing the show right now, Eno. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we are going over stochastic terrorism and talking about this damn video game here. This video game, obviously, it's just... It's hideous. It's terrible. It's one of the worst examples of stochastic terrorism. That is essentially speech that incites people to do terrorist attacks. And this isn't the only instance of this. Of course, sadly, if you go onto like Steam, Greenlight, you'll find a lot of questionable content out there. Uh, there's video games out there promoting school shootings, like school shooting simulators. There is actually a video game out there that was promoting Bolsonaro that people complained about it. And really the best thing that we can do in this against these kind of things is just report them don't even comment on them because you're you'll just get dogpiled because of how the video gaming community is because it is and it is re quite reactionary at this point so the best thing that you could do is just report it to steam tell them hey you know if you guys don't knock this off you know i'm gonna take my business elsewhere i'll find out how to get my games through another means if possible and following through with that hems games Games, I mean, really, it's just another form of propaganda. Like, that politicized games. Well, I mean, okay, Call of Duty. Call of Duty has always been to promote U.S. imperialism. But for specific, like, politicized games, I'm actually surprised it hasn't already been a thing. Which means we need games about the revolution. Well, I mean, there is Anarchy, which is a f nice looking game. Oh my it, gosh. It is, it is as cute as it sounds. And you get to play as, like, foxes and raccoons and cute animals. And they riot. It's really nice. You should play it. It's $15. You know, you dropped in and you had something to say about Anarchute. Oh, uh, no, not particularly about Anarchute, but the, uh, I've been watching a lot of leftist video essays on YouTube, which is a pastime that I would recommend to anyone who's trying to get a more concrete idea of what leftism is, the, the, the history of it, and uh, arguments with which you can effectively dunk on racists. One of the ones that I think Lindsay Ellis did was very thought provoking and it's about the identity crisis that a lot of uh, a lot of modern people have because of the insular way that modern capitalism in America breaks us up into family units and, and takes us away from our ancestral roots and everything. It's I'm sorry, it's hard to talk about this without sounding like one of those crazed Nord worshipping racists, but I feel that modern Americans, most especially um, modern, youngish, white American males have nothing to ground them in terms of a, a community or a set of hallowed tribal ideals to fall back on. All of our traditions have been muddied down into Walmart Thanksgiving and therefore a lot of people will latch on to anything that they can identify with, anything that they can call their primary identity. As Mike white Pence said, culture. Well, yes, that's that's actually the joke is white culture doesn't exist. And as much of a meme as that is, it is actually a very serious problem that we're facing right now. And it's, I think, one of the primary draws to authoritarianism, most especially fascism, most especially white nationalism, is because they offer a solid, cohesive identity for these people who feel lost in a way that they don't quite understand. Like uh, like Mike Pence said, I am a Christian. I am an American and I am a politician in that order. You, you understand the, the tiered way that he identifies? He identifies as a Christian more so than anything else. Any Christian can walk into nearly any church on earth and they have a community there. People who will support them when they're down, people who will listen to their ideas, people who will enrich them as people. So a lot of these gamers, you know, they, they, they start out watching the atheist YouTube so we know they don't identify religiously. A lot of these gamers say, keep politics out of everything. I'm not saying people who play games, I'm talking about capital G gamers. People who identify as a gamer, an American, a boy, etc. in that order. Their primary identity is video games because it's an easy identity. You don't have any culture to fall back on. All you have to do is learn the history of video games or enjoy playing video games or talk on YouTube about video games and you're a capital G gamer. 
It's a culture that anyone who can afford a game system can just slide into. They can be part of that community. There are books written on video games. There are hundreds of thousands of words on video game wikis. It is genuinely, at this point, a culture. So part of what I've been thinking about recently is how the crisis with identity, the lack of understanding of history and the lack of context for recent Western history is driving these people away from communities that would otherwise give them a healthy identity. It's driving them away from having a culture that they can they can fall back on, they can take comfort in, they can be enriched by. The only thing they really identify as is a gamer. And well that's that's because culture and everything within our culture has been commodified and turned into a capitalist facsimile of everything it once was. I actually gave a, a great example like in the chat like we were talking about like holiday facts and Misty wasn't having any of it by the way. She uh she wanted me to stop with the Christmas facts, apparently. But one of the, the interesting ones, and apparently Hems didn't know this either. Did you know that the modern Santa Claus, the thing that we see as Santa Claus today, was actually created as a Coca-Cola advertisement in like the 1890s? That's right. That's absolutely correct. Uh, you want to pull receipts on that. You won't have to look any further than Wikipedia. Is as far as I remember, if that article hasn't been modified. Yeah, if you want receipts on that, just go to Wikipedia. The modern Santa Claus, based on the old Saint Nick, is actually a propaganda tool to sell more uh, cocaine med. That actually pulls me into into the next topic here, because cause one of the things I actually wanted to go over is how right wingers kind of like cling on to all these fake conspiracy theories that don't exist as well and like this also like gets them hyped up for you know committing these mass murders that, that we see as well you just have to turn on alex jones to you know or even trump endorses this like we were talking about with like the white genocide the great replacement but also just some of the more bizarre stuff like the q Anon crowd was promoting this bizarre conspiracy about how space lasers were creating the fires in california it's just crazy stuff like the pizzagate stuff just all of this weird Kafka-esque just... And at the same time, the government is actually producing real lasers to shoot at protesters. Well, that and on top of on top of that, because actually I want to get to that a little bit later. There are actual conspiracies that do happen out there. Like the global well, like warming cover up corporations engaged in for decades. It's still going on where they're denying it. Coca-Cola, like, uh, like we were saying saying earlier, we were talking about Coca-Cola, they hired death squads in Latin America. The Nestle Corporation was using slave labor in Sierra Leone as late as 2016. Flint hasn't had water for four freaking years, and nobody's talking about that. There's an emerging water crisis in Newark, New Jersey, that they thought was maybe just the schools, but then they denied that and somebody tested the municipal water and it turned out there's lead in it. And then, of course, you have things like the Panama Papers that got exposed as well. There are actual conspiracies out there, but you never hear the right talk about these conspiracies because these conspiracies actually threaten the system of capitalism. Yes, exactly. And again, the whole thing about conspiracies goes right back into the concept of stochastic terrorism is these armchair patriots, these, these, these galaxy brain types, they'll sit there in their message boards and they'll be like, yeah, so they're kidnapping kids and they're taking them into the Chuck E. Cheese or wherever and they're just they was just selling them to Hillary so that she can do awful things to them. I'm sure you can imagine what. It would be great if someone could, like, you know, do something about that, you know? It's a very simple inlet to terrorism because you pump these people up full of these bad ideas and they're, they're, they're already well known for their lack of self-control and they get the idea that they're going to be the conquering hero who's going to go fix this huge problem. And it's really interesting that you mentioned the whole conspiracy theory thing that you see it's endemic in right-wing circles right after you're talking about stochastic terrorism. That is a flawless example. Yeah, and then we have all of the actual examples of all this coming into fruition this week because since the last time that we talked, which was right before the election, uh, we had the neo-Nazi gang. It was like 39 members of 
uh, the Unforgiven and the uh, United Aryan Brotherhood terror groups were arrested and they had a rocket launcher several pipe bombs, hundreds of firearms, and several pounds of meth and fentanyl, which probably was the only reason that they got caught was the meth and fentanyl. Which is how they got the rocket launcher shit, because the only way to fund anything like that is by buying and selling drugs, which is not something exclusive to them either. Like The left in South America has taken that route before too, because it's sort of what's it's the only thing left. At that point, how, how are you going to raise money? As a sign of things to come, the fascists are going to very much get involved with the, the drug trade because that's how they're going to finance their shit. While at the same time going on about these evil immigrants and the drugs. And then, of course, the the other thing that happened, and like we were talking about uh, with, you know, like how video games affect people, there was a teenager that killed his mother because he got into an argument because... His mother found that his grades were slipping because he was spending too much time on those 4chan boards and uh, she found out about it. And of course, this guy was a galaxy brain type. So like right after he did it, he like disposed of the body, went through all these complicated measures to try to cover it up. And then when he finally did actually you get killed called, your mom, you idiot. Someone's going to notice your mom's missing. Exactly. But here's the, here's the thing about this. Like after he got caught, he bragged in freaking court about how smart he was. Thank God our idiots, our enemies are such idiots. Uh, yeah, well, it's just the sobering well, part of this thing. Killed any of us. When they get angry about the left and the feminists, they don't go and kill the left and the feminists. They kill their mom. I mean, yeah, it's sad he killed his mom, but God, they're, they're all such morons. Yeah, go ahead. Bear in you know. mind, this is one example. This, this is just one case. And yeah, it is darkly hilarious in that sense. You know, he didn't actually go out and murder any leftist beta cucks like us. So, you know, we can sleep soundly tonight. But this, like the incident with the white supremacist gang having their weapons and drugs seized, it's like cockroaches. You see one incident like this and you know that right under your radar are going another hundred incidents. So this kid might very well have picked out a leftist or a minority at his school and chopped them up, took his anger out on them. And you know that for every gang that they bust that's got, you know, a rocket tube, some plastic explosives, a whole bunch of synthetic heroin and whatnot, there's five more, probably in that same state, hunkering down now because one of their own just got popped. That's the really sobering part of this, is every one of these darkly funny incidents where, oh no, he didn't kill any leftists, it was just his mom. You know that there are other dangerous people out there getting ready to getting ready to point their guns in what they think is the right direction. But also, I think that it, it does show that these people are targeting kids and warping and twisting them to, you know, kind of like, excuse the phrase, but do their bidding or whatever. They are going out there and targeting these kids to commit crimes on their behalf. That's the takeaway about that. And that is scary as hell. And I, I think that that's, that's one reason, like we always talk about, like if you're a parent, you, you know, you need to be on top of these kind of message boards and all these like social networking sites like Gab, 4chan. That needs to be something that these parents are aware of and alert about so that they can find out if their children are using them and intervene before it gets to that level. Do you think parents are that unaware? I always imagine that the parents are politically, if not right there in there in the Nazism with them, that they're just a few steps removed and that this stuff breeds in these households because it's given a free pass because they're all of the same political bent. And then so, uh, when it well, blows up in their it, face, it blows up in their face. Some of it, that's the case that it is the parents. But in other cases, it does turn out that these children are they, they stumble across these websites or whatever, or they get sucked into the culture and you're propagandized. And it's it, it wasn't that wasn't the starting point for for everybody. Some of these people do come from liberal families. Actually, a large majority of them do. It takes an understanding of how the right indoctrinates people in and how they suck people into their movement. They, they do target liberals, especially kids. 
Well, yeah, that's, uh, especially in my case, yeah, that's uh, pretty much how it happens. I come from uh, I come from a centrist family. I didn't really have any kind of identity other than Christian, which I rejected. So I go on 4chan, they're like, yeah, fuck Christ fags. And uh, also, you know, memes and culture and the history of the internet that you can find on Encyclopedia Dramatica. And I sponged all that right up. That's that's pretty much uh, what happened with me. That's how I got, well, not radicalized, but that's how I got pushed hard right, real fast. Something I saw on, on uh, B the other day, I, I tend not to go on poll anymore because it's just, you know, 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 know your enemy and all that, but it's hard for me to stomach much of that in a day. But I was on B the other day, and one of the things I saw was, uh, you know what commies say? Commies say liberals get the bullet too. So any of you liberals who are sneaking around on this board, I want to let you know that while you think they agree with you, the communists will shoot you when they win. So right is right, man. To go to a, a weird place for a second, I thought a lot about, about a missed opportunity I really had. Before I really figured it out, I was heavily involved with uh, volunteering for the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party has this ginormous voter database system that can pretty much, you know, pinpoint whether whether they're going to vote Democrat, how they voted in the past, if they vote, well, not how they voted, because that's legal, but if they voted in the past, party registration, where they live. And you can literally like, I want voters who are this, 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 live here and like this, and it'll print out a list. And I just think like, my God, what a, what a tool that could be used to like... I want mothers of children of this, this, and this who use 4chan and like send out a letter saying, Here, here's what Johnny's doing on the internet. You should watch out for this. That's what that kind of thing should be used for, right? Like, I'm sure that there are probably, I, I, I don't know what kind of trackers 4chan has, but there, there may be a way of doing that if they have like ad trackers. You could, you could find, and even if you didn't find them through 4chan per se, you could do it through other social networks because like on Facebook, you can advertise for people that are interested in, and then you could like choose like peripheral things that would be associated with 4chan. Actually, for Facebook kind of got in trouble for that recently because, like, right after the uh, the MAGA bomber and synagogue shooter thing, apparently one of the things that you could choose for uh, targeting advertisements to was interested in the topic of white genocide. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> so you could actually order an ad on Facebook and say, "I want these people." Yeah. Now, in fact. The yeah, in fact, The Intercept actually was the one that broke that story. And the reporter that found out about it actually used that particular topic to promote the story. Was there an equivalent for us? Can we take out ads for communists? I, I would guess that you, you could, I, as, as long as the topic's not explicitly banned in their advertisement system, which is actually what the problem is, is that it's just keywords. And unless the keywords get banned, the keywords can be used. Oh, I see. So it's not like there was, you want to target ads and you can have this list. You can send ad to people who like cooking, cars, sewing, and white supremacy, right? So it's not like it was, it was an official option to just, just hear the keywords that you want your ad to reach. Yeah, okay. sort of. And you could choose from trending ones too, which is how they found it as it was within the trending of a certain category. Oh, white genocide was yeah. trending. God. Yeah. Well, that just tells you a, a little bit about Facebook. Yeah. White genocide is trending. I wish. Uh, bad joke. But I would Ouch. like to clarify none of us here is advocating the use of an almost government scale panopticon in order to send out targeted deprogramming leftist propaganda. We're just saying, if it's there, why isn't anybody utilizing it for that noble purpose? It's utilized to go like knock on the doors of the people that Democrats know are gonna go vote for them anyway. And the conversation is never about issues. So I had those conversations. It was always, are you gonna vote for this person? Well, you really should. Well, you just should. Well, the Republicans are going to win if you don't. That's literally all this ginormous gargantuan thing is used for, and it really pisses me off. 
Well, there were a lot of times where I thought like, man, if only I could be like Hacker Man, download the plans to this Death Star and get it to the DSA and we could do some real fucking work with this, but no. I myself in the week leading up to election day received six text messages and two phone calls from four separate numbers reminding me to vote for Kirsten Cinema. Uh, we know how much Hems loves God. Kirsten Cinema. Let's just leave that to die. Uh, speaking of panopticons and police states here, one story that um, did catch my eye this week, and I want to prefix this with where the story is coming from. Uh, it does come from Russia today, which of course we all know is Russian state uh, news agency. So take that with what you will. I always just like to preface that when we're, we're talking about state news organizations, no matter the source. ICE and the, DA, D, the DEA are stocking up on cameras that can be hidden in street lights. So what these are is they put them up in the street lights and they can record what's going on. The company that they bought them from was called Cowboy Street Concealments, which really just sounds like some sort of like gay bar. Sounds like Ram Ranch. Oh God. <laughs> Your mind just always goes to the Ram Ranch, I swear. Yeah. The, the company that produce these cameras release like a really weird statement in regards to the technology and that is things are always being watched it doesn't matter if you're driving the street or visiting a friend if the government or law enforcement has a reason to set up surveillance there's great technology out there to do it and with the advent of because we talked about on previous shows how Amazon has created neural networks and artificial intelligence that can get, scan databases across you know, multiple jurisdictions and whatnot through a system called Palantir. And then also with the facial recognition technology that they have called recognition, they can instantly recognize the people on the camera and then access Palantir to pull up data and essentially just intercept anybody and that's coming within the next few years yeah it's gonna be it's gonna need a mass movement that is gonna destroy this stuff like all this stuff is is built for to target individuals and infiltrate things before they start and if you want to know how to beat the cameras well then you know what confuses the hell out of facial recognition cameras black people Oh yeah, that, oh, that wow. does. Th that that actually that's true. Uh, yeah, that, oh, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. It is true. Like it does. It is. Yes, yes. Cannot be tell the because yeah. Remember, because we actually had a story where we discussed that, where they had like a five percent accuracy rate on uh, people of color, whether or not they were Hispanic or uh, black. It, it didn't matter. Like their hit ratio was less than their miss ratio by 20 fold which just means you know that's just gonna be if any black person commits a crime anywhere any black person is the person who committed the crime even though everything's gonna be criminal you're not well, gonna I be mean, able to literally do anything without it being a crime in what way does that archetype deviate from what's currently going on it'll just happen more often but why lie? It happens. It's happening right now. It's been the norm since, uh, oh shoot. When was the year America had? 1792 was when America was officially founded under the United States Constitution. Because before 1792, we were running under the Articles of Confederation. But if you want to say technically, maybe 1776, which is when we declared independence. I'm just saying, hot take here. But as long as America has been a country, rather than a word for a landmass, America, the country, has been an anti-black police state. Prove me wrong. There, there's no way to, to prove that wrong. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the evidence is there. But just even looking at the department, so this is ICE and the DEA wanting to set up these cameras, not even local police enforcement. So this is for the purpose of using recognition and Palantir to round up uh, illegal immigrants and put them in the, the, the camps, essentially. And they're already doing that. So that's, that's even no exaggeration at this point. And they still exist, even though they've fallen out of the news cycle. 
the next item here that I, d I did want to get you here uh, was uh, in addition to the, the cameras, the other item under the police state here that we had as well was apparently the United States military has been building a miniature Tesla death ray to put on their MRAPs so that they could target civilian protesters. Lovely. This thing's called the Scalable Compact Ultra Short Pulse Laser System. Oh yeah, the Dazzler! Uh, gosh, I remember reading about that in Popular Mechanics around a decade ago. The fact is, calling any of these things new is erroneous. Not, not bad and not incorrect, but somewhat erroneous because the United States military industrial complex, as well as other nations, I'm quite sure, have been working on hilariously lethal and also less lethal directed energy weapon systems for the past 50 or 60 years. It goes back a bit further than that if you're willing to listen to some conspiracy theory nonsense on the internet, but confirmed around 50 or 60 years. A few of the things that they've been working on were uh, microwave cannons that evaporate all of the water in the target's body and kill them in a span of seconds. And that kind of came to fruition with their super cool radar dish looking thing that makes, uh, it agitates the water molecules under the skin of the target and makes them feel like they're being burnt alive, but they're not. They really, really wanted to put it into effect, but it got pushed back in testing because it might actually cause a huge amount of cancer and they don't quite know yet. Then there was the, uh, the LRADs. They, they do use those. It's a long range acoustic device. It fires disruptive frequencies at, I think the maximum range is somewhere around 100 meters, which is an incredible distance for an acoustic weapon to travel. Really great job with the engineering there. I should not be complimenting this stuff, but I am. The Dazzler is a weapon that, if, if we're talking about the same thing, of course, I haven't read the show notes, and I'm sorry, but if we're talking about the same thing, the Dazzler is a device that fires, I think it's four or six different frequencies of uh, laser, one of them is infrared at like several watts. And what it does is it disorients and it causes all kinds of trouble in the, the, the visual processing parts of the brain that lead to a, a lack of inertia, uh, nausea, in some cases, immediate unconsciousness, uh, sweating, irritable bowels, just a laundry list of fun things that happen to people that make them very, very not interested in um, standing up and shouting slogans anymore. A really interesting concept for a less lethal weapon. It's something that in the past 15 years we've seen uh, mirrored by US Marines who got their hands on PEC-2 and PEC-15 uh, at peel aiming systems and shined them into the commander's quarters in order to make him nauseous for a reason that he didn't quite understand. Infrared lasers at a high enough wattage cause immediate headaches and nausea in people who get too much of that stuff in their eyes. That's the basic concept upon which the Dazzler was based. Yeah, so this one, I'm not sure if it's the same one as you're talking about. It may be a little bit different. This one's kind of odd, and it has me a little bit confused because it's a laser weapon, but apparently it can produce speech and will be able to warn people up to a kilometer away. When it gets closer, it will be able to deliver a flashbang effect by sending an acoustic blast of... Uh, positive 165 decibels at a distance of uh, 100 meters. Uh, it has uh, the ability to send flashbang effects at 6 to 8 million chandela, so it can momentarily blind you at a distance of up to 100 meters. And then at the highest setting on the current model, it uh, has something called a full scalable thermal ablative effect, which is, I think, what you were talking about with the the skin burning but not burning but this one actually says that it can cause burns it says that it painfully vaporizes the outer layer of the skin uh rather than burning it will be turned into gas uh yeah that's flash vaporization yeah. a really really interesting chemical process on its own but what it sounds like is they've combined all of the really cool less lethal directed energy weapon systems that darpa has been working on for the past 40 years into one awesome combined arms machine and i'm not gonna lie to you man i ain't an authoritarian but i want one i want two you could just aim it at the police i wonder if like you aim it well, back you know what since it's a, a laser what if you just like put a mirror in front of it. 
Uh, that wouldn't really work. It depends upon the frequency, it depends upon the power and everything, but depending upon the composition of your mirror, in any likelihood, most mirrors, the frequency and the multitude of different frequencies that the laser generates, um, the frequency and the amplitude combined would shatter or burn most mirrors. The whole don't point lasers at mirrors thing does hold in most cases, but when you get into the really science fiction-y, this thing can generate an air blast kind of laser, that stops being the case. They will blow mirrors to pieces. You're, you're saying that it could generate voices at about a kilometer? Makes me think of this old, uh, this old CIA blueprint that they put in a book that has been pulled from shelves since that teaches you how to build a, um, a laser that not, not unlike a laser tripwire system, it has a, it has a tiny timer in it. If pointed at a, a mirror or a window or anything that, anything that reflects light fairly well and vibrates when noises happen near it, you can turn any flat plane surface into a listening device. And it was implied by this book that the CIA has been using this technology for quite a while now. And that's honestly something that has frightened the hell out of me. And this is a science fiction cliche, but by reversing the polarity and crossing two laser beams, you can actually generate vibrations in the air, causing you to make anomalous noises out of thin air, literally out of thin air, at any distance where your cross beams don't fuzz into each other. A tremendously interesting concept scientifically. I never made one myself because I didn't really have access to off-the-shelf parts, but the idea You're that the CIA that... could point a laser at a mirror and listen to you from across the oh. street is frightening. But you're also kind of saying, if I heard you correct, that you could also make somebody think that they're hearing the voice of God, basically. Uh, theoretically, yes. If you get two of these beams to cross with the right polarity and the right amplitude, the interplay between those two beams will cause the air to vibrate at whatever frequency you'd like it to. So by tuning the lasers very rapidly, you would probably need a modern day dye laser in order to do that, because as far as I know, dye lasers are the only ones that can be frequency tuned on the fly. Uh, you'd probably need a dye laser or a cluster of smaller multi-frequency lasers. Yeah, you could theoretically, by crossing these two beams at the perfect angle, generate any range of noises you'd like, literally out of thin air. Right, and of course, like I said, these are going to be used at protests in the future here. And of course, knowing that the police typically side with the fashion by typically 100% of the time, pretty much. I mean, it pretty much predictable how these are going to be used, who they're going to be used on in this particular case. And so it, it is a big worry, especially with all of the, uh, the, the leftist protests uh, showing up. You know, and counter protests as well. Uh, like there were leftist counter protests uh, to the Proud Boys in two cities uh, last week in Philadelphia and in Portland that both ended very bad for both of the uh, the Proud Boys groups there. The Philadelphia one just totally got outnumbered. The Proud Boys tried to instigate some fights and quickly got caught doing so and caused their entire thing to get shut down. The, the Portland one, though, was a little bit uh, more nasty. It was like a rape apology protest. And it was Haley Adams, Tiny Toes, and uh, Joey Gibson was there. And... Police basically disrupted that rally, started pointing weapons at peaceful protesters, and uh, one policeman even attacked a member of the Raging Grannies, uh, which is a peaceful protest group of elderly women, and the police officer just like threw her down on the concrete. Aren't they an offshoot of the Grey Panthers? They're just peaceful protest group. They, uh, they're senior citizens and they go around singing uh, union hymns and stuff like that at these protests. It's pretty cool. I, I know that's, a few of them. They, they usually dress up in their Sunday clothes. What? That's sweet as hell. Are you telling me there's literally a coalition of leftist grandmas? That's wonderful. This, this gives me hope. Uh, two things, though. Firstly, have you discussed uh, Jamel Roberson at all in this uh, in this podcast yet? And heck, I seem to have forgotten the other thing. Uh, no, we've not uh, discussed uh, Jamel Roberson. So uh, if you go ahead. Oh, and the uh, the other thing was I want to make a really bad joke that you're probably not going to be able to put in the podcast. Uh, so what you're saying is that in five years, there's going to be leftist protests to shut down the terrifying panopticon that's letting the Proud Boys do whatever they want. 
And then the terrifying Panopticon is going to get confused by a black person and say, naturally, that's a criminal. And then it's because of the neural networking going to hit up the automated system in a nearby MRAP and say, laser, blind that black person, make them hear the loudest voice of God you can, and then burn all of their skin off. And then when people start tweeting about it and Facebooking about it, they're going to get a bunch of targeted ads for laser pointers. That is a capitalist God. hell world that I could I could definitely put in the show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, that and also, yes, uh, there, there is a coalition of of leftist grandmas uh, who sometimes bring cookies to the uh, the protest, by the way. It gets better. I know it just keeps getting better all the time. But yeah, uh, tell us about Jamel. I, I read about it, but go ahead. Jamel Roberson was a bouncer at a bar, and he was armed. Some dude decided that it would be a great Friday night idea to go to the bar, but with a gun, and then shoot people at the bar with a gun. And uh, he decided to do this, unfortunately for him, on Jamel's shift, and Jamel, being an armed bouncer, killed him with a gun. So we have a classic NRA-positive good guy with a gun story. And it stops being positive in any way when the police show up. I mean, that's pretty much how it goes, right? Things stop being positive in any way when the police show up. They enter the building. They see a black man with a gun after having heard on the radio about somebody with a gun shooting up the bar. And they naturally extrapolate that this guy, who's not pointing a gun at anyone, or covered in blood, or having shown any other signs of having shot the place up, they naturally extrapolate that this fine young gentleman is the shooter and they uh, shoot him. Shoot him, he even died. though he was wearing a uniform that said security on it. Yeah, no, I, I, I read that the story. That is correct. He was wearing the uniform. It was an outright act of aggression against him. The, the police knew what they were doing and did it anyway situation. So Yeah, that, that could very strongly be argued that this was... Uh, if not intentional, grossly negligent in favor of white supremacists in the police force. Bear in mind, again, I probably forgot a lot of details about this story, and I genuinely don't like discussing it because this is one of the this is one of the sad ones. I know it's terrible anytime anyone is extrajudicially killed by a member of an authoritative policing apparatus in any government in any situation. But this one in particular messes with me. Because in my understanding of the events, the only, only, only reason that Jamel died was because he was an African-American man. That is, in my understanding of the events, the literal only reason. This is an NRA propaganda perfect pre-made story of a good guy with a gun saving the day for everyone. And that's why we need every bouncer in the world to have a gun and maybe some non-bouncers too, I guess. I don't even care that if he didn't die, it would have been perfect propaganda for the NRA. I don't actually care. This is one of those situations where there's really no feeling good about it in any way from any angle. Sorry, bit of a tirade. I hate this story. Yeah, no, it, it was a terrible story. It. I really do hope that we see some protests over this, that Black Lives Matter gets behind this. I actually read uh, about the story because uh, Dr. Bones posted about it on uh, Twitter. And if you don't know about Dr. Bones, go look him up. He's great. He has a great podcast called The, uh, the Guillotine and Rev Left Radio. That's how I heard about it. It is really depressing. The guy was a family man, so, you know, like, he left he left behind his wife and his daughter. So, you know, the guy that did this, like, he, these people hurt other people than just the people that, that they kill. And they hurt the communities because this guy, you know, he, he was a bouncer and... That, that kind of is an important job because, you know, sometimes, you know, people come to these clubs, they hit on, on women that aren't into it or, or whatever. And sometimes, you know, the bouncer comes around and has to pull those kind of people out. He's just doing his job trying to protect the people at the club. He does it and he gets shot for it. And if you want another kick in the teeth, that, uh, that daughter and wife you left behind, that's a nine-month-old daughter who cannot have this situation explained to her shortly before the holiday season. That's not strictly relevant, but on the on the human side of it, that's pretty dang relevant. And if that ain't enough kicks in the teeth for you, uh, the man was literally a choir boy. 
He sang in a church choir on Sundays and I believe Wednesday evenings, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so just another example of the police state going out and killing a African-American who uh, participated in his community was, you know, a, a model person. It's just like the, the uh, Philandro Castile story in, in, in many ways just kind of repeated, did everything right and still died. And in this case, he wasn't even stopped by the police or anything like that. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that wrong place, wrong time was just unfortunately his job. So I like I you said, could call it, you could call it wrong place, wrong time. But it would be even more reasonable to say that the police arrived late to a situation that he had already neutralized more effectively than they likely would have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is a it's a terrible story, but yeah. Uh, so uh, going out on this, uh, you know, had a few words here for us. If you'd like to do that, one day, in perhaps little time or in perhaps great time, we will tear up the deeds to the land. We will throw the debts into the furnace. Debts to God, to the banks, and to the landlords. Don your armor, don your helm, which was forged from an old plow's blade. Train your horses round and aim your guns for Sydney. I promise that we are many and they are few. And when this is all over, when the sun is setting on all of this, every one of these individuals who elected to extra judicially execute people who were just trying to live their lives and do their jobs, every one of them will be hanged with a short rope. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was gonna go out with a Ram Ranch joke, but no. From a long pole. Where's that it come from? That's really show. good. I love it. Up until uh, Train Your Guns to Sydney, that's all Blackbird Realm lyrics. And the other part is just me being really goddamn. <laughs> I love it. I think actually uh, we'll, we'll end it on that tonight because the show is getting a little bit long. So if you guys like what you hear, uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Leave a comment. Get in touch with us. Our... Our Twitter is at Enceladus1 for the show. Uh, my personal one is Kitsune Flame. And if you add at Macedon.social to that, that's my Macedon. Hems Fox, uh, you got any social stuff? Just Twitter. I haven't I haven't done Macedon yet. Oh, okay. The, so the, I don't want why does why do people want more than one Twitter? So so the one at, Twitter is so, so at Hems Fox, right? Yes. Okay. And then, you know, do you have any like social things if you want listeners to get in contact with you or are you good? If you find me, you'll know it. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good luck. <laughs>